Flying Blake from Green Fly Horizons. It's a cold, rainy day in Oakdale, California. We're talking about land tenure. The book Land Tenure Boundary Surveys and Cadastral Systems by Mr. George Cole and Donald Wilson. It's an excellent book. And uh, we're going over Chapter 5 today. So I'm going to review my study notes for Chapter 5. Hopefully that will help you guys out a little bit. I, it's possible I skipped Chapter 4. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't find my study notes for Chapter 4. I thought I did the video already. So I will look. If I haven't done Chapter 4, I will go back and do it. It's about uh, land subdivisions. Okay, so Chapter 5 is about land descriptions, also known as legal descriptions. I like the term land descriptions. That's the term that the book uses. Um, I think Waddles and some other surveyors use the term legal descriptions, but legal descriptions, land descriptions, same thing. Okay, so uh, what is a, a land description? It's a written description that uniquely describes and identifies a parcel of land. Okay, it's really important for a real property system and even for our economy. Whole books have been written about how the land tenure system and the way land is described is really important to capital, uh, to uh, capitalism, to uh, you know, to the modern market economy. Um, so let's just go through some of the key concepts in the book and early on in chapter four of the book. Early on. Chapter 5, I'm sorry. Early on in Chapter 5, uh, the authors talk about four types of boundaries. They talk about uh, the boundaries between private lands. So you have private land on each side. That's the most common type that, that boundary surveyors are dealing with. Then there's boundaries between public and private lands. Okay, So you own a private parcel next to the Forest Service land, for example, Forest Service land. That, so we also occasionally deal with those types of boundaries as land surveyors. Then there's boundaries between public jurisdictions, so that would be a boundary between counties or between a city and a county, or uh, could even be between two four service ranger districts. Okay? So uh, those are uh, jurisdictional boundaries, at which can be very important. Uh, then we have regulatory boundaries. Uh, those can also be very important. I added that one. I think he talks about the three, but I added regulatory boundaries. So just because of the type of work, work I do, I deal with that a lot. So that's, uh, for example, uh, the boundaries of zoning, zoning uh, areas or general plans or specific plans or, you know, um, sometimes you can't build within so many feet of a creek or, you know, there's just, it's just right, you know, the, the geographic footprint of regulations that impact rain. So that's a fourth kind of boundary that I added. So then early in chapter five, the authors talk about the char characteristics of good boundaries, quote unquote. So uh, what are those? They're permanent. So they're here today, they're here tomorrow, you can find them tomorrow. Uh, they're recognizable, so you, you, you know you can uh, you can identify them. They're easily identified or, or recognizable. So I think about like a blazed, a line of blazed trees um, along a, a, an old GLO boundary, right? It's easily recognizable. And then finally located, uh, you can locate it without amb ambiguity. So a competent boundary surveyor can locate that boundary on the ground and it's not subject to more than one location, right? You ask two surveyors, they put the line in the same spot. That's a good boundary. So those are the three qualities. He talks, uh, the authors talk a little bit about the basis for boundaries in, early on in the chapter. So you can have natural objects be the basis of a boundary. For example, a creek, a mountain ridge, or a tree. Okay. So again, if you think about natural monuments, they're permanent, they're recognizable, and you can locate them without ambiguity, typically. Uh, then there's man-made objects, okay, so that's what we typically set, set as a monument to mark a boundary line in modern times, so it's a pipe or a rebar or it's a disc set in concrete or, or bedrock, okay, so uh, Browns would call those artificial monuments. In the book on land tenure, they're called man-made objects. And then finally, the third one is legal or mathematical entities. That's just basically measurements. Right, so you can define a boundary based on natural objects, man-made objects, right, monuments, or through measurements, only measurements. Yeah, you got to be careful about that, right? Um, we do it we, as land surveyors. We do it, but it's always good to have monuments marking your boundary. But you can define a boundary with just mathematical um, entities or measurements, okay, bearings and distances. So then the book goes on to talk about the purpose of land descriptions. Okay, what's the purpose? It's to uniquely identify a parcel of land. That allows the land to be used in commercial transactions and for legal purposes. 
Uh, let your land behave as a capital asset, right? That's really important. I don't want to get super deep into the economics with you, but you know, once you can uniquely describe a piece of land on a, a parcel of land on a piece of paper, now you can take that to a bank and get a loan for it. Um, you can go and get a court judgment against it. It just enables all kinds of other things to happen. And then finally, having a written description of land allows you to get legal protection for your ownership of that land. Okay, so you can go to a court and say, uh, somebody's occupying my land, judge, kick them off. And uh, the judge is going to say, all right, give me, you know, I, I need to know what land you're talking about. You give him a land description. He says, yep, that's your land. Then you go out with the sheriff, right? Show the sheriff where the land is through a survey, right? Surveyor would do that. And then the sheriff kicks off the trespassers. Okay, then you talk about the types of land descriptions. Okay, and then we could do a whole video, maybe multiple videos on that. And I need to. It's one of the things I need to teach my text. But just to briefly go through the types. Uh, there's lot and block or descriptions that refer to a subdivision map. There's meets and bounds, right? Measurements and controlling calls, right? Bearings and distances and controlling calls called meets and bounds. There's public land survey system descriptions or output descriptions are also called. And then there's a whole bunch of hybrid descriptions, other descriptions, strip descriptions, descriptions by area, descriptions by width, descriptions using all the land on one side of a line. You need to do a video about those to talk about them, but. He's got a few pages in the book that describe each one. Then he talks about the requirements for a good land description. Um, I'm just going to rattle through them. They, the descriptions need to be correct and accurate. They need to be related to an established and identifiable point on the ground, preferably one that's physically marked. Should identify a unique parcel of land, right? Shouldn't be confusion about which parcel of land the description is talking about. Um, that description should be retraceable on the ground by a competent boundary surveyor. We mentioned that. And then he also talks about it should allow for the determination of the relationship between the subject parcel and the adjoiners. I think what he's talking about, what the authors are talking about in that case is, you know, it helps if when you're writing a description, if you call out your adjoiners. Um, I don't know if I agree with that 100 percent. It's an interesting concept, something that I need to think more about. I see it. I see it done in older descriptions. I don't see it done as much in more modern descriptions. That's like so that's. Uh, south 38 degrees west along the lands of Blake to the old oak tree the along the lands of Blake is your call your call to the adjoiner it's interesting something I need to think about maybe I, maybe I need to do it uh, then they talk about the main parts of a land description so he, he calls out two parts um, a caption and a body I've added a third in my notes so the caption just has the general location of the parcel and also can, might identify the parcel either through uh, a deed number or even an address or tax assessor parcel number um, or a lot lot in a, in a block of a subdivision map. I may also identify the legal jurisdiction of the parcel, so a parcel in the city of Stockton, county of San Joaquin, state of California, and it may also identify the, the current owners of the property. All of that may go in the caption. The body is the more detailed description of the land. That's what you're actually going to use to put the put the boundaries on the ground. And then my, the, the part that I add, the third part is what I call in notes. So that's information that the surveyor provides. It's kind of like metadata for you GIS folks, but it's information the surveyor provides about the description. So it could be information on the coordinate reference system, uh, the units that were used, the basis of bearing, or other notes. So it might, you might the surveyor might describe the purpose of the land description. Okay, so those are, I put those in in notes, call those in notes usually. Um, I wish more surveyors would do those. I think they're important for a modern land description many times. So then you just, you get some special considerations for land descriptions. These are just kind of rules or, or guidelines. So you should have sufficient information for your document references. So in other words, if you're going to call out a map. So this to the north line of lot two is shown on bill subdivision, right? You got to give enough information for the surveyor to go find that document. So, you know, that's the recording identifier, either a document number or book and page, the date that the document was recorded, and the document name, if it has one. So, phase two of Valley Oak subdivision, as an example. Okay, you should have your basis of bearings in there. If you use bearings, you should have some information about your coordinate reference system, your datum, your scale factor. And then finally, he says, uh, the authors say you need to have sufficient data for all your curves. That can mess up new surveyors. So, you know, if you have a non-tangent curve, you got to give a cord bearing or a radial. 
you know, if you're for any curve, you need to have the arc length and the radius. So they talk a little bit at the end of chapter five about plats, land description plats. You know, plats aid in the interpretation of the written description. A lot of jurisdictions require them, or agencies require them. Uh, usually, your plats have to meet the requirements of the recorder. What does that mean in the United States? Most of the time, it means they got to be on an eight and a half by eleven sheet, which can be kind of tough sometimes. And uh, they usually have to be black and white. They've got to be legible. Um, he talks about what should be shown on a plat. Should show the subject parcel boundary with measurements. Should show your point of commencement if you have one. Should show your point of beginning. Other points of reference. Should identify the subject parcel and ownership information, and also the adjoiner parcel. A joiner parcel should be identified and the ownership information from, for those parcels should be provided. So there you go. Chapter 5 of the book on land tenure. All right, excellent book. I encourage you to pick it up if you're a boundary surveyor and you don't have it. And um, it, uh, what I like about the Chapter 5 of this book is it, it does a good job explaining why land descriptions are important and kind of their role in our cadastral system and even a little bit about how they're important in our economy. And, uh, you know, so a book like Waddles... There's more than one. There's two or three books just about about land descriptions. Waddles is one of them. Uh, but I don't know that any of those books do a good job of kind of putting land descriptions in in um, in their place in the in the context of the broader cadastral system or real estate system. And these gentlemen do a good job of that in chapter five of this book. I will go back and do chapter four if I haven't done so already, and I will get these study notes posted online. Hope these uh, videos are helping you guys as you move through. These couple of books that we're covering, Brown's Boundary Control Legal Principles, and this book by Mr. Cole and Mr. William Wilson on land tenure. Thank you for watching. Um, keep up your studies. I know it's tough. Be, be persistent.